Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Armchair Art Tour with Wendy O'Brien. Uh, we're very happy to have this series back for 2021. Um, my name is Melanie Blake, and I'm the Director of Classical Pursuits. And I'm here today with Samantha Clark, Marketing Manager at our travel, at our travel partner, Worldwide Quest, and with our presenter, Wendy O'Brien, Worldwide Quest leader, Classical Pursuits leader, and uh, as I said in our recent blog post, a tr true force of nature. Um, those of you who were with Wendy for her armchair art tours last year uh, know what a treat you're in for today. Uh, this is our polar edition. So Wendy, over the next three Thursdays, Wendy will be talking about all things wintry arts. Uh, today, we're going to start with Wilson Snowflake Bentley, uh, who, is, who from a young age was interested in snowflakes and especially uh, microphotography of so the photography of very small things, specifically snowflakes. And I'm sure we're going to see a ton of just incredible pictures, Wendy. I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, a few quick notes before we start. Uh, the, so the, uh, there's a couple ways you can interact uh, with us during the presentation. Uh, we will have a Q&A session at the end with Wendy. And if you would like to ask a question, uh, you can use the questions feature in your inner in your go to webinar interface you'll either see the word questions or perhaps a question mark icon depending on what type of device you're using just click on that to expand the field and type in your question you can also make a comment in the chat function uh, most of the interfaces will also have a chat function if you uh, need to adjust your audio you can click on the word audio, or you might also see a headphone or a, like an earpiece icon, and you can open that and adjust the audio settings to your liking. If you are having any trouble, uh, the best way is to send a question to to Samantha in the question field. She'll, uh, she'll be here throughout the seminar helping you solve any problems. Uh, and again, this is the first in a three-part series, so Wendy will be with us for the next two Thursdays. Wendy also has Wendy also leads small group seminars for Classical Pursuits, and they are all sold out right now, but I know she has, except for one, um, uh, our seminar on Ian McEwan's Atonement, uh, a, a truly, uh, I just love this novel, Wendy. I, I love this novel so much. And uh, if you haven't read it, you should, and you should read it with Wendy. Um, there's still plenty of time uh, to sign up for that. It starts on March 17th. And I know Wendy has a lot of other things in the pipeline and we'll be uh, putting, up mo putting more about that up on our website soon. So again, uh, stick with Wendy for the next two weeks and uh, read Atonement with Wendy starting on March 17th. All right, so I will, oh, Wendy, you want me to stay on for another moment and then I'm going to head out until the Q&A. I, I do because uh, I have a question for you in a few minutes, um, Melanie. Uh, but I wanted to start um, with, whoops, with uh, reading a poem. I hope, I hope you'll all entertain me with this, but I, I think it'll kind of give a framework for uh, our look today at the work of Wilson Bentley and uh, our look over the next few weeks at artists who are fascinated with ice and snow. Um, the poem is called First Snow by Mary Oliver. The snow began here this morning and all day continued. It's white rhetoric everywhere, calling us back to why, how, whence, such beauty and what the meaning, such an oracular fever flowing past windows an energy it seemed would never ebb never settle less than lovely and only now deep into the night it's finally ended the silence is immense and the heavens still hold a million candles nowhere the familiar things stars the moon the darkness we expect and nightly turn from Trees glitter like castles of ribbons. The broad fields smolder with light 
a passing creek bed lies heaped with shining hills. And though the questions that have assailed us all day remain, not a single answer has been found. Walking out now into the silence and the light under the trees and through the fields, it feels like one. Uh, I love that poem. And uh, it was part of the inspiration for uh, starting this series with everybody. Hello all, thank you all um, who are coming back uh, for another armchair art tour series uh, and to do winter, no less. Uh, and hello everybody who's new, uh, so glad to have you with us. Uh, yeah, snow and winter. It might've seemed like kind of a torturous thing to put us all up to, especially cause, and who would have known that uh, this great polar vortex is covering North America right now. Uh, a dear friend of mine in Texas who often uh, watches these mentioned to me this morning or sent me a message and said, I, I don't think I'll be able to catch on to the internet. We're having such problems given uh, the weather today. She thought it was quite funny. Uh, Melanie, m this is my question for you. Melanie, are you a snow person? I love snow. Yeah, I, you know, I don't see it as much now in living in Oakland. Um, and but I grew up outside of Philadelphia and lived in New York City for a long time. And you know, I'm a frequent visitor to Toronto when there's not a pandemic. And uh, one of my very happy, happiest memories is um, I think the winter of 1993 was especially snowy, snowy and cold in in much of the North Atlantic seaboard in the Northeast. And uh, there was a kind of marshy area behind our house and it snowed so much for so long and was so cold that the entire thing became a like an ice rink as far as you could see. Yeah. And every day we would just go out and spend all day on the ice. And that remains one of my very happiest childhood memories. Well, this is why we're friends, Melanie. Uh, you and I are, are well, I love the snow too. This is me just a, a week ago in the middle of uh, nowhere on, an, on a lake that was frozen. And for me, you know, something like this is my idea of heaven. But Melanie, I hope you know that uh, you and I are, are weirdos in many regards. Uh, you know, many people look at something like this and go, no, just say no. Uh, it's white and cold. And, and did I mention cold and white? And looking at it, uh, well, they realize or acknowledge why uh, in the book of Job, God talks to Job about snow. Uh, you know, for many people, winter is hard. And I think this winter in particular has been hard as we approach living with a pandemic for almost a year now. It's kind of an interesting time for me in that regard, being winter and the difficulties that we're having with it, because I've always been interested, or in my career, I've always been interested in the idea of wonder. You see, once upon a time, individually and collectively, we wondered at the world. Um, when you're a little kid, if you remember, remember all the questions you asked and all the awe that you experienced. You know, we wondered at the world in those two regards. And we also wondered at the world collectively. Um, for a long period of time, wonder was the standard that we used to judge natural beauty, scientific achievement, and artistic excellence. But then, then something happened. Then we sort of stopped using the word. I spent a, a lot of time kind of looking for its use. And, and once we hit about 1900 moving forward, there are so rare accounts of this notion of wonder. Uh, in fact, looking through, I could find, in the, especially in the late uh, 20th century, the few references I found were, were in the 1960s and related to psychedelic drugs, and I think that's a different notion altogether. Anyways, I got very interested in trying to figure out what happened to us. You know, when did we stop wondering at the world? And did we stop or did we give it other kinds of words? And if we did stop, you know, how do you get your wonder back? And I have to say those questions have begun to have a, a new meaning or a new resonance to me during the pandemic. As it's kind of worn on this winter, 
as many as have, have been wintering during the winter of our discontent. But something is a bit different. I think it's become hard for people to wonder. And so I wanted to think about that very specifically and very specifically to the notion of winter. And that's really where the series came from. I thought it would be interesting to look at those people who are subject to ice and cold and who instead of finding their uh, things to dismay over, found things to wonder about. That's where we're headed today with uh, Wilson Snowflake Bentley. And then I thought I'd like to move on and talk about those people who live in what Adam Gottnip in his wonderful Massey Lectures Winter describes as the radical winter of the Great North. I wanted to think about what their relationship was to the wildlife around them, to the landscape, how, how they could help us get through this winter. And, and lastly, I wanted to look at those people who seek out the ice and snow. This is David McEwen, who will join us in our last session. David has gone to the Arctic uh, I think it's almost 30 years now. He's gone every year and he's gone there to paint. I wanted to think a little bit about, well, if we could find something to wonder about once more here in the winter, in everything that's big. This is one of David's paintings, by the way. He's going to talk with us about uh, not only what draws him to the Arctic, but about all the challenges of painting in the Arctic. I wanted to think about, you know, what can we learn from him about the various notions or forms of winter that we're experiencing from his adventures in the Arctic. And I also wanted to think about what we can learn from the little experiences, the everyday experiences of, of the winter, of the, of the stuff that we don't have to travel long and far to find, but we have right here and, and right around us. And really, that's where my interest came into the works of this man. This is Wilson Bentley. Uh, Wilson Bentley. I, you know what? I had to stumble over the words, and I'll tell you why. Because I'm so used to describing him as Wilson Snowflake Bentley. But but this is before he had the snowflake added to his name. Uh, this is Wilson Bentley when he was just Wilson Bentley. He was born in 1865, and he was born here in Jericho, Vermont. This is his family's home. Now, if you don't know where Jericho is, it's between Lake Champlain and Mount Mansfield. It is absolutely stunning, stunning country. And I have to say, right from the very start, when he was incredibly young, um, Wilson, well, he loved the natural world. You know, he would spend all his time outside. You know those kids? I had one like this, and you'd be yelling at them, come in for dinner. Uh, that's what uh, Wilson was like. He had this affinity to the natural world. And well, he started to look at it, look at it incredibly carefully already when he was 15. When he was 15. Hey, Wendy, my interrupt, may I interrupt you for a second? Can yeah. you please move your cursor off the photo? Oh, yeah, no. <laughs> Sorry, my our nemesis, our eternal nemesis. <laughs> oh, that damn cursor. Uh, sorry, everybody. Um, but here, here's Wilson, um, Wilson's um, microscope. So when he was 15 for his birthday, he inherited this old microscope. And he started to look at the natural world through the microscope. A and more specifically than that, what he got really interested in looking at and what he was really interested in participating in was in, in looking at snow. In looking at snow and, and it's a good thing because uh, Jericho is in the snow belt where they have an annual um, snowfall of about 120 inches yes for those of us who complain when we get an inch or so uh, Jericho's right there uh, getting about 120 inches each year and you know good thing for him that he liked the snow because as I mentioned they got a lot of it here's a picture of him out, uh, I think this is, uh, might not be his sister, it might be his sister-in-law, and you notice he's got snow already in his hand, ready to throw those snowballs. Uh, for him, snow was magical. It was just magical. He said at one time that snow was as beautiful as butterflies or flowers. But, 
Well, he could look at it under his microscope, but it was hard to capture that experience, hard to capture that magic that he saw, hard to capture that, the words even, to explain what it was he saw. It was somehow incredibly elusive. And well, just like a snowflake melts so quickly, he found that his words and his images that he tried to draw of them, well, they disappeared so quickly. Now, his attempt to give word and image to snow uh, is part of a long history and a long tradition. Many people think that our first real look at snow, uh, at not just snowflakes, but snow crystals, the small elements that combine to make a snowflake, those uh, small elements, well, the first time we hear people starting to talk about and study of them goes back to 135 uh, BC uh, to the Han, Han dis, dynasty, the Han dynasty. I have to put it up here to remember the Han dynasty and to the writings of a man named Han Ying. In his works, he says, flowers of plants and trees are generally five pointed, but those of snow are always six pointed. Amazing that you know, with his bare eye, he was able to record this small but oh so important fact uh, about snow crystals. Um, we see the first sort of images of, of snow, of snow crystals coming here. This is Olus Magnus and in 1555, he created woodcuts uh, of snow. And what's amazing about these particular um, woodcuts is that he recognized or was already um, noticing how different they all were. He was noticing the great variety of, of kinds of snow crystals that resulted. From Olas Magnuson in 1555, we could trace the history uh, of, of looking at describing snow crystals uh, to somebody kind of surprising, surprising to me. Uh, Johann Kepler, which many of us might know the name of, uh, because of his works in astronomy. Uh, Johann Kepler, here in this particular work on, uh, it was a New Year's gift, as you can see there, um, offered up in 1610, wrote this work on the sixth corner snowflake. Um, what he was interested in was trying to figure out in this work, why six? Well, like of all the possible numbers, why six? And, and we may sit back and go, because, but, but Kepler had a different kind of mind than that. He wanted to kind of figure out, to rationally pursue this question about why six? Why six different um, arms or, or elements to a snowflake? He used a kind of rational scientific approach for the very first time to the, the study of snowflakes, in his words, snow crystals, as, as we'll see coming up later. And that inspired another really surprising person who was fascinated with snowflakes. Are you ready? Yeah, how about Descartes? This is Descartes' work on optics, meteorology, and geometry. And included in his discussion of meteorology, he talked about snowflakes. And in fact, this uh, is um, from one of his pages where he's looking at snowflakes in some early drawings that he made, etchings that he made of what snowflakes would look like. Still very rudimentary though, still very, you know, um, it looks like the way I sort of draw, still very simplistic in its model. It wouldn't be until the development of the microscope that the images that we were able to capture of a snow crystal, they would change. And where we see that first is with Robert Hooke. Robert Hooke was one of the people involved in the development of the microscope. And more specifically, why he's so important is he started to put everyday objects under the microscope and to look at them. And I can only imagine what that must have been like, right? To take a snowflake and for the first time have it magnified. Now, those early magnifications would be maybe up to six times the size of the uh, actual object. What he must have seen, it, it must have been, totally miraculous. What he did here is he would look at the microscope and he would look at his snow crystals and then he would try to draw them. But he himself recognized he was no great uh, 
great artist. And so they were still very rudimentary. But we start to get more detailed um, ideas about the structure and also the incredible beauty of snow crystals is with this guy. This is Scoresby, which many people may know as a, one of the great explorers of the North and also one of the whalers of the North. In his notebooks from the 1920s, and I know this is a bit, it's hard to see, but I wanted to give you some idea of, of well, first off, just how he covered the pages, but a little bit of some of the drawings that he would offer. He did these remarkable etchings of snowflakes, of snow crystals more specifically. He took such great care. Here's a, another image that you can take a look at where you see the detail that he gets into, the intricacies of the drawings as he tried to understand more about what the snow crystal was like and in many ways lay the groundwork for this person. This is James Glacier, uh, one of those people sort of lost to um, the history of science. Uh, he was the first, one of the original co-founders of the Royal Meteorological Society. He was involved in a lot of um, early studies of the weather uh, and early findings, early scientific findings concerning wind and rain. And anyways, here he is. Uh, and his book, Snow Crystals, where he did these drawings, these incredibly intricate, detailed drawings of snowflakes. And they are sort of remarkable little works of art, and little it is the right word, but I just wanted you to have a chance to see how beautiful they are. Here's one that's blown up. And what it might have taken to draw this to pay such careful and close attention to an image like this, or to create something as beautiful as these images that you see uh, on the screen in front of you. I, I wanted to talk a little bit about Glacier in advance of talking about Wilson Bentley, because I think Glacier, we already saw two things that will be important for Bentley's study of snow crystals. That is identifying both the beauty and also the science that's involved in its formation, bringing together both art and science with nature. And maybe if you think back to me talking about wonder being the standard we used for scientific achievement, natural beauty and artistic excellence, you can see why I'm so drawn to this group of artists, artists of uh, snow and ice. Here is a, a table that's been made of, of many of the drawings that Glacier did. And if you have a chance, go online and, and look them up because they are these remarkable little works of art. Following in the footsteps of Glacier, we have good old, here he is again, Wilson before Snowflake. We had Wilson Bentley and he tried to, to look through his microscope and capture in his drawings what he saw. Uh, apparently, he had about 400 drawings at one point in time of snow crystals that he had done. Um, unfortunately, uh, they were all destroyed eventually, so we have none of them that I can uh, show you now. But I can tell you, um, it's really hard, eh, to draw a snowflake, uh, something that he recognized. Um, here's a quote from him. He said, under the microscope, I found that the snow snowflakes were miracles of beauty. Beauty should not be, that could not be, sorry. Snowflakes were miracles of beauty and it seemed a shame that this beauty could not be seen and appreciated by others. Every crystal was a masterpiece of design and no one design was ever repeated. When a snowflake melted, the design was lost forever. Just that much beauty was gone without leaving any record behind. I became possessed with a great desire to show people something of this wonderful loveliness, an ambition to become, in some measure, its preserver. That's something he wrote about his early love of, of snow crystals and, and the limitations of drawing what he saw under the microscope. I have to tell you, uh, I have a bunch of snowflakes. I'm not sure if you can see behind me because every year for Christmas, we add a snowflake to the tree. So this love of snowflakes is real and true. Uh, and this year, 
to the tree, I, I decided, because I knew I was doing uh, this talk, to try to draw and make my own snowflake. So here it is. Um, I challenge anybody to sit back and to understand what problems these early investigators of the snow crystal were having. Uh, try to draw one just as you see it, or, or try to embroider one just as you see it. It ain't easy. Uh, and, and like Bentley said in this quote, he wanted to be able to share this great miracle, these masterpieces he found with others. And so, well, when he was 16, this is all happening before he's 16. When he's 16, he reads in a magazine about a camera. He reads in a magazine about a very specific camera, which would allow for photo micrograph micrography. I have a hard time with that word, photo micrography. Uh, and uh, what it would allow him to do was to hook a camera up to a microscope. Now, one thing about Bentley is he was obsessed with snow and the study of nature uh, from uh, this really young age. And I can just imagine he reads about this in a magazine and he pesters his mother unendingly. Uh, and on the, his 17th birthday, he actually received one of these cameras. Um, at the time, it was said that it would have been about the cost of a cow. And that farm that we saw was a 10 cow dairy farm. So you can imagine how expensive, what a luxury it was that his family bought for him this camera. Now here's a picture with him of him much later, but I like it because you get a sense of what the camera itself looked like a little bit better. The camera was attached to a microscope at the end, and the microscope originally, as I mentioned, um, as with many of the early microscopes, was able to magnify um, whatever it was put in front of it about six times um, the, uh, the original image. Later on, he would have a much better microscope. It would be able to magnify 64 times. And, and then towards the end of his life, he had yet another um, more powerful microscope. What it was like to actually use this is sort of remarkable. And one of his colleagues, W.J. Humphreys, who we'll talk about a little bit towards the end of our talk today, at one point in time, tried to write a description of what it was like to use this camera. And, and here's what he said. This is from uh, W.A. Bentley and W.J. Humphrey's book called Snow Crystals. This is what he says. He says, how is this done? Well, first you catch your snow crystal. This is conveniently done by holding a smooth blackboard a foot or so square, a moment or two, or as long as necessary in the falling snow. The catch is then taken under shelter to keep it from being blown off the board or otherwise disturbed, where the light is good and the temperatures that of outdoors. After a hasty inspection with a suitable magnifying glass, a promising crystal, if one is found, is transferred carefully and with the most delicate touch to a suitable glass plate, a microscopic slide with a small wooden splint and they're pressed down flat or brought into other proper position and made slightly to adhere to the glass by the gentle stroke of a small winged feather. After this, it would be more minutely examined with a microscope to determine whether or not it is worthy of photographic preservation. If it seems to be worthy, there is nothing it, worthless, there's nothing to do, of course, but to start all over again. When, however, a photograph of a crystal is to be obtained, it obviously is necessary to take it with a photo micro, micrograph camera, and that is a microscope fitted with a camera bellows and a plate holder where the eyepiece normally is placed or farther removed. The camera is turned towards the sky, either directly or through a window. Then, or previously, if more convenient, the crystal adhered to the glass slide is properly centered in front of the low power, one half to three inch microscope objective, and the focusing so adjusted as to give a picture of the desired size. The plate holder is then put in position, lens covered, slide of plate holder drawn, lens uncovered for the time of exposure, lens covered again, and the slide put back. One may proceed now, if one likes, similarly to make other exposures. Okay, well, that took me a while to read. Can you imagine? You have to do this and do this incredibly 
quickly because of course snowflakes melt uh, if they get too warm. And one of the things that Bentley writes about is you know, some of his early experimentations, he would get everything set just right and then he would breathe and the snowflake would melt. His very breath would take the snowflake away. It, it was incredibly complicated hooking up the camera to the microscope. And, and I like this photograph because, well, one of the things you notice is that uh, Wilson wasn't all that tall. And you may go, Wendy, why are you talking about that? But uh, the reason why is the length of it, to be able to adjust the microscope, his arms weren't long enough. And he actually had to invent kind of a, a holder that allowed him to adjust the microscope. It was like a stick with an end on it so he could work the, the uh, lens itself because it was so difficult. And, and also look at the length of this and think about how heavy this would be to, to manage and to deal with. And then the big problem was the question of exposure. And that was really one of the big challenges. You know, how long did you have to leave the lens open on these early cameras? How long did you leave the lens open in order to capture the image? Well, he got his camera when he was 17 in 1883. And in 1885, at the age of 19, he had his first let's see, let me picture of the camera. He had his first success. In 1885, he was able to photograph using this incredible complicated system, 20 snow crystals. Uh, and I can only imagine when he first was successful, what that must have been like, eh? To see a snow crystal. And yeah, it's sort of just the outline of it. We, we get a sense a bit of the structure here. Over time, as he perfected, especially the manipulation of the lens, more and more details came into place. Yeah, that first year, 1885, he got 12 images of snow crystals. Uh, interesting because uh, of all the days and all the weeks to be talking about this. Um, in 1928, it was his most successful 24 hours of taking pictures. It was on Valentine's Day in 1928. There was a horrible storm that lasted two days. He called it the king of winter, uh, though, because he was able to take 100 photographs of snow crystals that particular day. So here he is, as you see him a little bit uh, later, with his camera all set up, uh, a little bit more sophisticated camera that we have here as he got a little bit older. A and we can watch him kind of in the process. Here he is trying to capture the snowflake with his microscope on um, a slide. And then what he would do is he would take the image and, and I'm so grateful that we have this picture. We have very few pictures of him. He loved to take pictures of other people, of snow, of nature. And he, like me, hated hated having his picture actually taken. But I'm grateful for this one because what we see him doing here is he would actually cut out the image. So the original image that would, would be white on white with the outline around it. And what he would do is he would take a very small knife and he would cut the image out of it. And then you see it here, he would put it on a black background and then then take up the photo again from there. Now, just so that you know, um, he always kept those original negatives, which is really important for scientists today who continue to use his images for the study of meteorology. But he, we have the original uh, still, but he would take these pictures on the black background to make the details come forward. And here you see uh, what one of his uh, slides, one of his negatives would have looked like. Now, I can't imagine what it must have been like for him the first day that he saw something that, that looked like this or, or something that looked like this up here. At, over time, what he was able to do was the images got sharper and with increasing detail in them. And just so much incredible beauty that he was able to capture. He would really spend the rest of his life uh, photographing uh, snowflakes that look like this. And 
many people go, oh, I've never heard of Wilson Snowflake. Now you see why, Bentley. Uh, but you sort of do, because if you've ever heard the phrase that no two snowflakes are alike, that comes from Bentley and from his research. He's the person who actually was able to photograph snowflakes and discover that while in their beginnings, while the original crystals were the same and the structure was the same, that there was this infinite variety, this infinite variety of, of images that would be produced. Uh, oh, he did photograph other things. Uh, here's an image. He got interested in clouds. I always think of Stieglitz, the um, amazing American uh, photographer and his equivalences when I look at this image. But this is uh, from Bentley uh, much earlier. He was interested in clouds and totally fascinated with water. He tried to capture raindrops uh, in some of his images. And just hold on. Uh, this is an image he took uh, using uh, that camera of a spider's web covered in dew. Oh, oh yeah, he could have spent his time, you know, photographing all these things, or, or or even frost. He did occasionally do photographs of frost on window panes that looked like this and looked like this. But really, these were all kind of distractions from the thing that he loved the most, which was the photographing of the snow crystals. He would photograph them and eventually, it took, took a long time, he was well into his late 20s before he actually ever sold any of his images. He sold them as lantern slides uh, for five cents a piece. Uh, and one of the first places to actually buy his images, one of the first uh, purchasers was, was Harvard University because they immediately recognized the scientific value for the study of meteor meteorology and also for physics, cloud physics more specifically, of, of his images. But five cents, and it's so interesting to me, he never charged more than five cents throughout his life uh, as his fame increased across his lifetime. Never more than five cents uh, for an image. What we see in Bentley, in his studies and in his photographs is a rising understanding about, well, the formation, the science of the snow crystal. Um, he wrote many technical articles to try to explain how it is that a snow crystal that starts uh, high up in the atmosphere, all the same, how because of things like wind, um, moisture, and temperature, how that transforms and how it transforms that crystal exactly the same way along all six lines. Um, much of what we still know about this science, um, Bentley was able to discover, not because he has a science background at all, but because of his incredible, careful observations of the little things that surrounded him. Um, I can't begin, and I wouldn't try to begin to explain the science of snow crystals, but there is a great uh, science uh, cloud physicist uh, who, if you follow the link that's at the bottom of this screen or type in snow crystals, uh, he will explain all the details involved in the formation of snow crystals. Many of those details, as I mentioned, uh, were first recognized and published uh, in technical articles uh, by Bentley himself. Bentley was interested in the technical elements, the science of the snowflake, but he was also always very clear and very aware of the artistic elements or aspects of it. This is what he wrote at one point in time. He said, the snow crystals come to us not only to reveal the wondrous beauty of the minute in nature, but to teach us that all earthly beauty is transient and must soon fade away. But though the beauty of the snow is evanescent, like the beauties of the autumn, as of the evening sky, it fades to come again. I find that passage so incredibly beautiful. And I should have put it up on a slide. I will uh, be sure to pass it on to Melanie so that she can share it with you when she sends out links to today's webinar for those who would like to revisit it or to follow some of the links about Bentley's work and his writings. I find that so beautiful. He himself thought he was a terrible writer. It took him a long time before he wrote. 
But what I loved about it is his recognition that there was in his study of the snow crystal, both incredible science, but also incredible beauty. The, these two elements always um, combine together. And I think that that becomes clearest here in, in this particular montage that he created. In 1901, the Pan American Expo occurred in Buffalo and um, Bentley entered into the exposition, this particular montage. What he did was he created the snow crystal out of 125 images of snow crystals that he had taken. It was the one and only time uh, that he showed the montage, um, though he did take this negative of it. He did take a slide of it. So that's what we're having a, a chance to look at here today. And his niece said that he had originally done something very similar, but with his hand drawings that he had done before he had received the camera to be able to photograph it. But I thought it was so beautiful, an image that he would understand that science and art, far from being separate, were one and the same, that they could be kind of reconciled in this particular way. Now, Bentley published, as I mentioned, widely in technical um, magazines, but he also published in popular magazines as well, Popular Science, uh, had many articles by Bentley in it, as did Harper's Magazine, probably one of my favorite uh, articles that he wrote, it comes from Harper, where, by the way, he does talk about this relationship between science and art, science and beauty, and how they fit together with each other something that I think oftentimes uh, we lose a sense of. Uh, while he published widely, and, and while he was selling to universities and colleges his slides, he figured at one point in time that he had spent about $15,000 on his studies of the snowflake, and he had received back only about $4,000. Um, luckily for, that, for him, that farm that we saw, that dairy farm that he grew up on in Jericho, was incredibly successful and it was able to fund him in many ways, but he, he wasn't making a lot of money. Um, he wasn't making a lot of money by taking his show on the road either. He became a very popular um, lecturer and speaker, coming including to uh, Montreal. The one winter he didn't spend in Vermont, he spent in Montreal as he spent time at McGill University uh, in order to, to further his studies with meteorologists and physicists there who were interested in his work. As a result of that, he never made a lot of money. He never had money to be able to publish. And in 1929, being recognized by the scientific community for his incredible contribution uh, to the study of the snow crystal, um, 60 scientists joined together to um, publish the book that you saw me hold up a, a few minutes ago, the book I read that elaborate uh, explanation of what it was uh, that he did. Here it is, it's Snow Crystals, and you notice know, so it's written by Bentley and one of those scientists who helped with the funding, W.J. Humphreys. In it, what we have, as it says at the bottom, is 2,435 of the 5,000 images of snow crystals, these beautiful works of art, these beautiful scientific studies that Bentley was able to create. Now the book did fall out of publication for a period of time, uh, but you can now purchase it uh, once more. Just a warning, there's a short, very scientific essay uh, at the beginning of the book, and then it's just the images. I know many people will go, what? But just trust me, they are, are exquisite, these 2,453 images, most of which the last 15 pages have some images of frost in them, most of which were his beautiful study of um, snow crystals. Now, that same year, 1929, uh, Bentley went out into a blizzard and uh, went to uh, walk home and to take pictures uh, during a snowstorm. So from the age of 19, uh, forward until his death. Every winter he was out in the snow. But the winter of 1929, this particular blizzard was harsh and it was hard. 
and um, as a result of being left out in the blizzard probably too long, uh, he weakened his immune system and, and he would die that year. Never to really understand all that he had accomplished, I don't think. Um, all that he had given us in terms of true beauty and in terms of true great knowledge. Uh, 1929, he was, uh, he died as a result of complications due to uh, pneumonia. Um, there is today, if you go, that farm remains there. Uh, if you go today, this plaque has been put up in his honor. Uh, for 50 years, Wilson A. Bentley, he was a farmer and a self-taught scientist, developed his technique of photomicrography to reveal the world and the grandeur and mystery of the snowflake, its universal hexagonal shape and its infinite number of lovely designs. Um, I thought, if I can take a minute, I would read you the beautiful um, obituary that was written in the Burlington Press. It was the day before Christmas, um, and this was part of a, a series of eulogies and tributes uh, to Bentley that was published on that particular day. This was uh, what was written. Longfellow said that genius is infinite painstaking. John Ruskin declared that genius is only a superior power of seeing. Wilson Bentley was a living example of this type of genius. He saw something in the snowflakes which other men failed to see, not because they could not see, but because they had not the patience and the understanding to look. Truly, greatness blooms in quiet corners and flourishes under strange circumstances. For Wilson Bentley was a greater man than many a millionaire who lives in the luxury of which the, quote, snowflake man never dreamed. Well, that eulogy and this ability of Bentley, his obsession, maybe, his dedication to the study, to the beauty and the science of the snowflake, of something so small in such harsh, harsh times. I, I guess that's why I thought it was it's so important to kind of bring him to the forefront now it, during our winter, the winter that we see on the outside and the winter that we find ourselves facing on the inside. Um, I, I mentioned at the beginning that there's a reference in the book of Job uh, to snow. And uh, at one point in time, uh, God asks Job, have you yet found the treasure in the snow? And uh, thinking of good old Wilson Snowflake Bentley. I think he was one of the rare people amongst us who could say, I did, I did indeed find the treasure in the snow. Thank you everybody uh, for listening to this conversation uh, and for sharing in a little bit of my total love and passion uh, for uh, Bentley's amazing uh, snow art and snow science. Uh, Melanie, are you back with me? Uh, yes, I I am back. Um, wow, I am so moved. I'm so moved by this man and and what he did. I, I, I'm sort of at a loss for for words. Um, it's so inspiring. Um, wow. I can't begin to tell you. There is a marvelous um, biography that I found, and I think it's just a small press that wrote it. It's called uh, the Snowflake Man. And it was done by Duncan C. Blanchard. Uh, I read this book in that place you saw me standing out on the lake that's all frozen <laughs> over. And I found myself sort of weeping, I have to say. And I'm not really a weeper, uh, but there are some parts uh, that are just so beautiful. And for him to get us to look at these like little ordinary things and to find beauty and majesty in them. Um, yeah. Man, like, isn't that, yeah, what, what a, an amazing human being and what a great model for us during our own winter. I'm just imagining them or him transferring the snowflake from this black board onto, how, like, I was just trying to imagine how that would happen. It's, it's incredible. Um, and the patience, wow. and 
breathe on it, right? Like you breathe on it. Uh oh, <laughs> yeah. Like that's it. Oh, and then your arms are too short, and you can't adjust. I don't know if you can see me. You can't adjust the microscope lens to get it clear. So then, like the innovation that he had. Um, thinking about it, I know some people who are with us today was uh, were with us as well when uh, I had a chance to talk about uh, James Audubon. And in many ways, I thought of him as sort of the Audubon of snow uh, in terms of, you know, both his innovation, his artistry, and also this incredible attention to detail that he had. He's, he's, he's uh, yeah, well worth spending some time thinking about uh, his model and his art. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to to learn more to learn more about him. Thank you so much, Wendy. What uh, what a yeah, I'm really moved and and inspired. Um, and I have a question, and I also yeah, we would love to hear from you. Um, Wendy will be taking questions, so please do send in your questions using the question function. And while everybody's uh, thinking of their questions, just a couple quick reminders. Um, we will send out the uh, recording and links to the different resources that Wendy mentioned, um, the Massey lectures, the biography, all of the other um, materials that she mentioned. And Can you do a quick plug on that? Yeah. You thought, uh, guess what? I don't know if I've had a chance to tell you yet, uh, but I just found out I'm going to be a grandmother for the very first time. And uh, I already have one book for my uh, <laughs> grandbaby. Uh, and cool. it's Snowflake Bentley. If you are looking for a beautiful um, account of this story and just great images of what a Bentley's life was like, I can't begin to uh, you know more highly recommend this for uh, your children or your grandchildren. It's written by Jacqueline Briggs Martin, illustrated by Mary Azarian, and it won uh, the Caldecott Medal uh, for Excellence in Children's Work. So anyway, sorry to interrupt, but I, I just no, had to no, we'll, inc we'll include that as well. It looks beautiful. Um, oh, I am gonna go get it myself. Um, and uh, one second. Oh, so yes, uh, we'll we'll send all those resources, including the children's book. And um, uh, Wendy has lots more coming up. And if you want to, um, I guess then then aside from the armchair art tours, the next big thing is her atonement seminar. Um, her stuff has pretty much always sold out uh, through through this past year. So if you uh, if you want to get in on atonement, don't wait um, because her stuff sells out. Um, so you can find more info on the Classical Pursuits website. And uh, a little further down the road, going into the field with Wendy uh, in Newfoundland in Gromorne National Park, um, Wendy will be leading a trip with classic, or sorry, with, with uh, Worldwide Quest. Sorry, with Worldwide Quest. Sorry, Samantha. Uh, and so that's, this is a chance to go into the field with Wendy. Um, we'll include information about that. And um, we know that you know there, there is uncertainty, but we are very hopeful for our fall trips. I know Worldwide Quest has been working really hard. And uh, for any Worldwide Quest trip, whether it's a Classical Pursuits trip or Wendy's trips, any Worldwide Quest trip um, through the end of March, you can put down a $50 deposit. It's very flexible. You know, we we, we are committed and flexible. We're just gonna, we are, we're gonna roll with this pandemic and we will be back on the road and Wendy will be in Gromorn in September. Um, all right, so let me just look here. Has question, yes, questions have come in. Um, oh, Carol, you have, uh, Carol read your mind, Wendy. She, uh, She's mentioned this book by um, Jacqueline Briggs Martin. So thanks, Carol, for that. And we'll again put that in the um, in the uh, follow up. And Priscilla asks, can you give the name of the author of the? Um, so I'm not. Uh, your question uh, has a word here. I'm not quite sure what you're asking. Do you mean the biography of Bentley? If you could just um, yeah, the um, biography of Bentley, and I might have it. There it is. I, uh, I didn't. Snowflake. I think he's a, a you know small publishing company. Who knows whether they will survive? Uh, and I did want to give Duncan C. Blanchard a uh, a plug for his beautiful biography of Wilson A. Bentley. And he goes back and looks at you know the history of snowflakes, 
thank you for helping me with that. Uh, the history of the family. He does a, a really great job uh, in giving us beautiful stories. So that that's the book. Uh, and, and thanks for, for asking because, yeah, support small publishers, support bookstores. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, Wendy, my question was um, the yeah. the works by Glacier that you showed at, yeah. uh, toward the beginning. Uh, were they um, were they pen and ink? What did what did he? How did he make those? Yeah, you know what? Um, some were pen and ink. Um, some are painted. Painting a snowflake is incredibly difficult. Did I mention my feeble attempt to embroider one? Uh, and I was looking at it and I'm going, I failed. They're not the same. Uh, no, it's good. <laughs> no, no, it looks better from afar. I think. <laughs> but uh, so I most a lot of things are, are like pen and ink drawings. And like I said, I, I wish I'm going to go looking for um, a biography of Glacier because uh, the beauty of those drawings and just the patience of, of drawing a snowflake. And, uh, you know, I would love folks, uh, you know, try, give your, your, give it a try and uh if you if you do is send them uh on to us and uh i'd love to uh have a chance to look at them and, and share them with others if you're interested it is incredibly complicated uh the one person that i kind of missed in that history coming up to bentley and his photographs was there was an anonymous woman who did a book of cutouts and i don't know about you but you remember doing cutouts of snowflakes in school and all the i still do cutouts of snowflakes yeah I think we all <laughs> should do it. well and it's also you know reinstill that sense of wonder at the small things that surround us all the time especially during the pandemic uh yeah rock on and and do some cut out snowflakes but she did this incredibly detailed book of of snowflakes and uh we never knew who she was or or where it came from but she did publish that um but yeah glacier's just such an interesting guy he was also as i think i mentioned uh, one of the co-founders of the Royal Meteorological Society eventually and has an important role in the history of uh, meteorology. So uh, th yeah, there you go. A little bit about him. Uh, I'm gonna go find out more though because uh, again, one of those people who combine science and art and are filled with wonder. Um, thanks, Wendy. So again, if there, uh, do send in questions if you have any. I guess I, I have one more question. Um, do is there a scientific answer to why there are uh, why snowflakes are hexagons? Has anybody figured out the the core reason for it? I think okay. So I've spent some time over getting ready for this, doing something that uh, is sort of my idea of torture, but I wanted to understand more of the science of of the snowflake. And so I went on the websites, especially that great website called The Snow Crystal that I mentioned, where they try to explain the science of it. And I think as to why six remains a bit of a mystery and so interesting, because that's one of the first observations we have all the way back from 135 uh, BC. Uh, we have more understanding about why um, all six branches are the same and that has to do with the fact that you have a crystal that starts the same in the high atmosphere uh, as it falls towards the ground uh, what happens is it's subjected to the same weather uh, to the same amount of moisture and to the same temperature so that's why all six branches uh, become the same but to the question of why six i think it remains sort of a mystery i, I didn't find anybody who could give me a good answer or at least one that i could follow uh, as to why it's a hexagon. But there are also other shapes, which people don't know that probably the most rare of snowflakes isn't a hexagon, but a triangle. Just think on that for a little bit. Um, and, and so there's a research, and it's so interesting that Wilson Bentley actually identified all the various shapes, the fundamental shapes of snowflakes through his, his photographs, but also that he realized that there were these small tubes of air that caused um, the formation, their specific formations. So if you think about him as an amateur scientist and what he contributed, it, it's quite remarkable. Thanks, Wendy. Um, something else just came in here. Chris, okay, Chris is uh, sending an article from Scientific American. Yeah, so thank we, Go ahead, sorry, go ahead, Wendy. 
oh no, thank you. Send send anything that can kind of explain all the intricacies of it. Uh, because as I was saying, I'm I'm uh, still fascinated uh, to try to understand the science behind it. And science is I'm a philosopher. Science is a struggle for me. Uh, and I think I mentioned I'm interested in wonder, and I'm really interested in the natural world. I spent most of my career uh, talking about uh, art and artistic achievement, I th thinking that science is the last frontier for me uh, as I continue uh, my wonder project. So uh, thank you for sending that, and uh, we'll share it with others as well. Yeah, thank you, Chris. And just a comment from Mary Lou, um, kind of echo echoing what you had talked about early in your presentation, Wendy. Um, she says, I'm trying to imagine how amazing it must have been for him to see a snow crystal in his early pictures. Oh yeah, yeah and it, it, it yeah the physical sensation of like seeing this thing that you've been how amazing eh? dreaming oh. about yeah. and the one thing and I, I will warn people I'm sorry I did disappear I'm just leaning over to get my copy of snow crystals this is the um, reprint of that original one. It went out of print for a long period of time, but uh, is back in print now uh, by Dover Publications. Uh, there's also a, a smaller version. It's not all 2,453 uh, of the images, but one of the things that I really admired about this particular publication is they tried to put them in order chronologically. Mm. So one of the things I didn't talk about was that when he started to take these photographs, um, the good, the bad, and the ugly, he kept incredibly detailed notebooks. He kept two notebooks all the time. One which listed the photographs that he took and sort of the circumstances, what was good and what was bad and what was not so, you know, the good, the bad, and the ugly of, of his uh, experimentations with, I'm gonna try photo micrography. Uh, and um, he also kept another notebook at the same time, which was a very detailed account of the weather. Um, and anyways, it, they were able to use the notebooks to try to put the images in um, some kind of chronological order. And you see like the very simple, and I showed you one of those earlier ones, which is just sort of the hexagon. Um, and, and you see the details coming forward. I tried to, in my presentation today, to put them in some kind of order, something akin to how he would have discovered more and more detail. So I guess the reason I mentioned that is it wasn't just that amazement at seeing one of the crystals finally appear. That must have been phenomenal, but has more and more detail as he got better and better at, at photographing them. And so much about how long to leave the lens open and, and the kind of lighting you had to be under that he had to experiment with. It was a constant process of amazement. And uh, many of the essays that he wrote are filled with that sense. Of, of true wonder at what he was discovering, at, at the beauty of what he was able to see. So I, I'm with you on that one. And and think about, you know, many people today uh, maybe are seeing some of his images for the first time or else they didn't know it was a Bentley snowflake that they were looking at. Um, you know, we look at them and we gasp uh, at their beauty. Could you imagine what it was like for him? Uh, it's just phenomenal. Uh. Um, we have one last question from Kathleen, and uh, maybe some of the links also would answer this question. Uh, are ice crystals also hexagonal? Yes, ice crystals are hexagonal, and when ice crystals come together, they become a snowflake. So this was taking me a very long time, and there are great there are great uh, videos out there that show this that kind of explain it. So what he was really interested in, what he's taking pictures of aren't snowflakes, but the elemental building blocks of snowflakes, which are snow crystals. And snow crystals are hexagonal, and when they come together, they form a hexagon. Crazy, eh? Yeah, very cool, very cool. Um, I think that's all the questions we have for today. Yes, so thank you again, Wendy. Thank you so much for, for this, this incredible presentation. It really made made my day and I hope it made the day of everybody else listening. Thanks for being with us. So again, we'll be back uh, same time, same place next week. Wendy will be talking about uh, the artists of Cape Dorset, Nunavut in Northern Canada. And then the week after that, the third part of this series, a Q&A with the Arctic watercolorist David McCowan will be joining Wendy. We're really happy to have him come talk with, with all of you. 
and uh, more to do with Wendy uh, Atonement, March 27th, and Grow Mourn in September. Uh, as always, feel, feel free to contact us with any questions. Uh, Samantha at Worldwide Quest, me at Classical Pursuits, and uh, we will get you an answer. Thank you again, everyone, so much for being part of our uh, armchair art tours. And thank you, Wendy. Thank you, Samantha. And we look forward to seeing everyone next week. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Have a good day.